This is the 2023 Toyota Highlander. It's available with a hybrid all-wheel drive system and loaded with features. In this episode, we're gonna check out all the details and then take it on an adventure. That's coming up right now on Driving Sports TV. When it comes to three-row family crossovers, one of the best sellers in the United States is the Toyota Highlander, and it's easy to see why. It drives nice, it's loaded with features, and of course, it's a Toyota, so reliability is assumed. But in this category, competition is moving fast. The Hyundai Palisade and Ford Explorer are both making moves, and a Honda has an all-new pilot coming later this year. So it's really important for Toyota to keep their Highlander up to date if they want to stay at the top of the sales charts. The model we're looking at today is the loaded Platinum Hybrid with all-wheel drive. Prices you see it here with no extra options, $53,760 US dollars, including destination. In terms of powertrain, I really like what Toyota has here. It's a hybrid all-wheel drive system that features a 2.5 liter gas engine along with two electric motor generators, one in the front and a second sits in the back to power the rear wheels. Total system output is rated at 243 horsepower and 175 pound-feet of torque. Of course, front-wheel drive is also available. The standard transmission on all hybrid trims is an eCVT. EPA rates economy of this setup at 35 miles to the gallon in the city and 34 on the highway. No, I didn't get that wrong. The city is actually higher than the highway MPGs simply because around town with stop and go traffic, you can better take advantage of hybrid traits like regenerative braking. Towing capacity on all hybrid models is 3,500 pounds. On the adventure portion of this video, a little bit later, we can't go too crazy because these are Goodyear Eagle tires. They are an all season and they are on massive 20 inch rims. Yeah, this is a 235-55 R20 and this is the standard tire and wheel package when you get the Platinum. It looks real nice, but I'm a little concerned of uh, on the trail to make sure that we don't damage these really nice looking wheels. If cargo space is a concern, the Highlander is a great choice. Behind the second row, you get up to 16 cubic feet of cargo capacity. Fold the third row down and you get 48.4 cubic feet behind the second row. Fold all rows flat and you get 84.3 cubic feet overall. It's actually a ton of space. And of course, the big question, can you sleep in it? Of course. I don't think I'd be lying if I said that this was bigger than my first uh, apartment in college. Not bad. The downside though is since this has uh, captain's chairs, there's a big gap in the middle. So you would need to cover that with a piece of plywood or something. Under the floor here, you have privacy screen storage, which you can put up here if you want. Also, there are tools for changing a tire. And yes, this has a spare. It is located underneath. Okay, let's get up. <clears throat> okay, so third row is obviously on the snug side. I can't even fit. My head is pivoting on the roof. Um, although I think this will be fine for kids. I can recline slightly. There's a lever right there. So I can go back a little bit more, which does kind of make it a little bit better. But yeah, you're not gonna to wanna to put adults back here. Um, nice thing back here though, is that we do get two cup holders on each side, but where Hyundai in the Palisade at this price level, you will get USB sockets back here. They're not to be found here in the Highlander. Okay, now that we've been in the third row, time to get in the real, seat an adult will sit in second row 
The captain's chairs are comfortable. I like the armrest, it's easy adjustable. I could push it out of the way if I don't want it. This panorama sunroof just lets in a ton of light, which is good, especially because we have a really dark interior going on here. Nice little inlay there. We get privacy screen. Down here, we also have our own zone for aircon, three stages of heat, two USB-C sockets, and an AC socket. Oh, almost forgot to mention, two cup holders right in the middle. Of course, if you buy one of these, you're more likely gonna be driving than sitting in the back. Up front here, we have some significant improvements. It's powered up. Of course, the engine doesn't start up all the time because it's a hybrid. Uh, if the battery is fully charged, it'll just turn on the car. Won't hear that gas motor at all. Now we got some really nice things. There's the gas motor, <laughs> right on cue. Now we got some really nice things going on here. Digital display in the center cluster. This is now standard on the Platinum trims. It is a 12.3 inch digital display. It's gorgeous, nice graphics, beautiful clarity on the display. I can also go through and modify the layout. It's not as intuitive as some other systems, uh, but I can get most of the information that I would be looking for. Everything from best MPGs uh, to individual tire pressures uh, to, you know, uh, all the active safety stuff. And yeah, this is still loaded with all the active safety stuff you would expect from Toyota. Rear view camera uh, with surround view on this 12.3 inch center display. I also get tracking lines, which look really good. Heads up display, uh, lane trace assist, blind spot monitoring, pre-collision, parking sonars, rear cross traffic alerts, rear auto braking, uh, street sign identification, and of course it also has adaptive cruise control with lane centering, which is something I really like on long trips. And this rig is meant for long trips. It's big, it's comfortable, and it's really smooth, but we'll talk more about that a little bit later. This whole layout I think actually looks pretty nice. It's an evolution of the prior design. And up here we finally have modern infotainment. Yeah, this is the system that first made its premiere in Lexus vehicles last year. Uh, and then it came out in the Tundra. Uh, and now it is available here in the Highlander. And this is a really nice homegrown system. Uh, it provides everything from navigation to terrestrial radio to XM satellite radio to all your setups. Uh, if you do need a plug-in, there's USB slots down here. Uh, you have a USB-A and two USB-C that are power only, plus you also get a 12 volt socket, which is nice. Now, in terms of wireless CarPlay, it works really well. I've already synced this device. It's just a two-step process, and you can actually sync multiple Bluetooth devices, which is cool. So if you have a work phone and a home phone, you can have those both available for hands-free uh, talking. But for wireless CarPlay here, it is, every time I start the vehicle up, it just connects. And that, of course, is beautiful on this really, really nice display. I love the quality of the display they went with and the fact that every vehicle that is getting this new infotainment system has the same high quality display. And they don't make you have to use the display for everything. As we look right below this, yeah, we get physical knobs, buttons, and dials for everything from aircon to the heated and cooled seats, which is a nice touch. Uh, it's just, it's a really cool setup. I really like it. And of course, if you're connected to wireless CarPlay, you need a way to charge. You can either plug in through the USB-C or USB-A socket, or you can use the wireless charger pad, which is located right here. Now, one thing I am noticing is I have an iPhone 14 Pro. That is a very large camera module. And I'm noticing that because it sticks out and it's not flush where the battery charger plate would go, these things are very, very finicky as to whether or not they will charge at all. And I'm having trouble. Okay, this one, it looks like it's charging right now. So that's good. I'm going to keep an eye on that and see how finicky it is going forward, because I know a lot of people have this particular device. And going back to that rear view camera, you'll note that the surround view, as we drive forward, it'll actually paint in imagery under the vehicle, which kind of works a little bit like a trail cam. Um, again, really nice feature there. Even though, yeah, they're just sticking this in everything, I'm really glad they are because it's a great system. Moving on down here, we have the controller for the ECVT. Now, the ECVT uh, uses a planetary gear. 
Uh, in addition to a continuously variable transmission, it's a nice setup. I can go into sport and do manual fake shifting, or I can just you know go into drive if I want. Below that, we have all sorts of settings here, everything from the useless EV mode, which is good for going around parking lots, that's about it. There's also a trail mode, which we'll try a little bit later. And then on the left here, we have drive mode, sport, normal, and eco. And that'll adjust the amount of power output from the electrical system. So if you want more power to that rear electric motor, you go into sport. There you go. Of course, that's going to affect economy. So you may not want to do that if economy is your um, you know, reason for buying something like this. You're probably just going to keep it in normal or eco most of the time. JBL sound is standard at this trim level. Nice touch. Uh, yeah. That's pretty much it. Oh, we also have, in addition to seat warmers, seat coolers, uh, we also have a steering wheel warmer, which is a button right down there. Uh, seats, super cushy, very comfortable. Lots of power adjustments on both sides. Uh, and then you also get memory positions on the driver's side, one and two. Oh, side mirrors. Yeah, they now fold in. They're powered. How do you like that? <laughs> okay. Enough talking about this vehicle, time to take it for a drive. And today's adventure, we are gonna go in search of the high steel bridge, which is I think the second highest steel bridge in North America. And it happens to be just about an hour away. So let's go on an adventure. Before we head into the mountains, I really want to see how this all-wheel drive system's trail mode will respond to tricky conditions, because I don't think our trip today into the mountains is really going to be that complicated. Because of that, I'm going to go ahead and give it a run through our easy course. Now, this is our pre-built course that we built for easy crossovers. We call it Chicken Run because we actually have chickens on it, and they're running when we get there. So, pretty straightforward. <laughs> This course is basically designed with undulations, little ditching on one side, um, a little bit of a buildup on the other side to really articulate the vehicle as much as it can um, and also specifically remove wheels from traction so that we can see how power is shifted around the system. Now this vehicle in particular has a dedicated electric motor in the back. So we're gonna see how soon and how much power comes out of that electric motor. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it on to trail mode. When I do that, my gauge cluster gets a little brownish. It's kind of a little brownish and bluish. Now we have a couple things to worry about here. First off, only eight inches of ground clearance, which is not a ton, but it's actually pretty good. Uh, but the more important issue here is actually the overhang. The front overhang is pretty far out there. And I want to make sure that I don't have any issues. Now, I love the fact that this comes standard with a trail cam. The surround view functions as a trail cam very nicely. Got to listen for crunching. Don't want to scoop up some mud with that front nose if I can avoid it. So far, this is all gravity assist. And, but it does give me a chance to feel the suspension. And it actually does a really good job of soaking up some of these uh, harsher bumps. Now we got the log here. Let's cross the log. Okay, there we go. Now this vehicle is on the large side and we have a, a little bit of a log on the left side. So I'm gonna be putting driver's side wheel on that log and it is very slippery. Even vehicles like the Forester uh, Wilderness from Subaru have issues here because it is a challenge. Make sure I'm not scooping up any mud. Okay, as we rotate around, I can see the log right there. We're going to put our wheel on it. It's probably going to slip a lot. Yep. So I can hear it clicking, and that is the attempt to shift power to the back. Okay. Every vehicle has trouble with this. It's really hard. Uh, basically, we're removing a lot of traction off of a lot of wheels at once. Oh, I got to hit that trail button again. Man, my kingdom for a... Um, sorry, I got to hit the, the camera again for a camera that stays on. Come on. Can you do it? Can you do it? Ugh. Doesn't want to push me up and over. Let's get more straightened approach here. Got a little space here, but not a lot. There's a tree right behind over there. Ah, got to turn that view camera on again. Okay, there's that tricky log. So we'll just kind of go... Uh, 
Getting really close to those branches over there. But we made it over. Okay. That was a that was actually a little bit more complicated than I thought it would be. A lot of the issue is this longer wheelbase uh, versus compact crossovers, but also you know, it just wasn't giving enough power in the back to, to push us over that log. Um, although the way that turn is configured, it does require that all the power needs to go to one rear wheel to really be effective. And there's just not a lot of vehicles that can do that. So this time we don't have gravity to help us. Now it's a matter of the vehicle driving up all by itself. Oh, we're in all electric mode. It just decided this would be a good time to do that. Oh, let's turn on the view. Make sure all the chickens get out of the way. Now the big issue here is going to actually be, we're going to lift a rear wheel here, I think. Let's go in there. Okay, there we go. So we are on a little bit of a dip and then up again. And we're going to see how that power goes to the back. And yeah, it did a good job there. Didn't take a lot, though. Now we're going to climb out of <laughs> chickens running right in front of us there. Over the log. And now we have to go up the hill with the ditches. And we'll see how traction works here. Boy, we're actually in all electric mode right now too, which is kind of neat. Okay, so that wasn't too bad. It actually did a pretty good job of shifting power around. It didn't have enough power to really deadlift the vehicle over that log that we needed it to, uh, but that's not unusual. A lot of vehicles have a lot of problems there. Okay, now that we've tested the trail system, we know its limitations, it's time to head into the mountains. It's on the highway here where the Highlander really comes into its own. This is a crossover built for cruising. It is smooth, it is quiet, it has really good tech, it's comfortable, visibility is excellent. I mean, really, there is a lot to like about this vehicle. And of course, it does come with the latest version of Toyota's Safety Sense system, which means that it has adaptive cruise control. And here it also has lane centering. Uh, to do that, I'm going to go ahead and trigger off of Nick in the Ranger. That's our rescue Ranger in front of us. So to use our adaptive cruise control, all I have to do is turn it on, set a target speed, set the gap, and uh, yeah, it'll now track right behind the Ranger, never exceeding its speed. Now I want to show you how well this will actually steer. It is not intended as a hands-free system, but it does track the lanes very nicely. And that is, of course, to cut down on fatigue on long trips. It is not, a, you know, a, a autonomous system. The only autonomous system as of filming of this video uh, is a new one by Mercedes-Benz. They just got qualified for a level three system. Uh, so far, everything else is basically this level. Yes, even Tesla. Sorry, Tesla fanboys, it's, it's a level two system. So let's talk about what we're doing today. There is a bridge in Washington state, which I believe is the second tallest bridge in North America. I think that's what it is. And we just call it the high steel bridge. And we're gonna go there today. Uh, and the trip out there is just really pleasant. We're gonna go through some farming areas uh, and then we're gonna hit some dirt roads and then we'll find the bridge. We're not gonna have any like, you know, ridiculous hill climbs and I don't think we're gonna have anything too challenging, which is why we did the off-road course before we left. Uh, so this is just kind of sit back, relax, enjoy Washington State uh, because we're just gonna have a good time today. And in the process, find out what we like and don't like about this new Highlander. But so far, there is a lot to like here. While cruising here, I do just have it in normal mode. In fact, this vehicle, it's just, even though it has a sport mode, that's not really the vibe that this vehicle is all about. It's about economy, comfort, the ability to throw the whole family in, plus their gear. And that last bit is what's critical. Sure, there's some other vehicles on the market that have a third row, but sometimes, you know, 
with that third row up, there is zero space for cargo. This one actually has a reasonable amount of room behind that third row. And of course, if you fold down the third row, you get a really nice spacious cargo area, which is great. The weather today has been all over the place, but it's been mostly rain. Uh, so we're going to be encountering some bits of rain uh, and it has been raining rather heavily. So there might be, you know, some areas of flooding that we got to look out for. But I think I think today's adventure is going to be pretty chill. I think it is currently a high tide right now and we're on the king tides, which means that it's a very high tide, uh, which might lead to also some additional flooding. But I think we'll be fine today. You might notice that on Apple Maps here, we have a waypoint put in, but that routing is also being transferred over to the vehicle. Very often, Apple Maps is just separate from the vehicle, but this one supports the carts protocol, which allows me to see individual turn-by-turn -turn directions in the car's gauge cluster, which is neat. Uh, that also means that I can optionally have them up in my heads-up display if I like. It's kind of cool setup, and it's pretty smart because they put the turn-by-turn -turn directions in the main gauge cluster until right before I need to make the turn, and then it throws it up into my heads-up display as kind of a, hey, pay attention. <laughs> and then once I've done that, it then puts it back down here, and uh, only my critical need-to-know-now information is up in the heads-up display. It's a really nice setup. They've obviously thought this through pretty good. One thing that I did have to do with this vehicle the moment I started driving, though, was turn off the beeps. The beeps, Toyota and beeps, they need to really chill because way too many beeps. I don't usually mind a nav system that beeps when you're hitting options, but combine that with the vehicle's tendency to want to beep for everything, and that's just too many beeps. I had to shut down the nav system's auditory feedback because I just could not deal with it, which is funny because usually that just doesn't bug me. Uh, but yeah, Toyota, please, I beg you, turn down the beeps. If you beep at everything, nobody will pay attention to anything. That's how it works. So there's my tip to Toyota right there. Up, oh, we have another turn coming up. So the nav has moved from here back up to my heads up display. That's cool. I will say these seats are very comfortable, but it's like you start to like sink in them over time because they're so soft. Although they are really comfortable. I've been driving this now for about 40 minutes. No hot spots. It's all really good still. And these seat warmers, they're, uh, they're pretty toasty. Well, there's certainly signs of flooding today. Um, how do I know? Well, literally there's a sign right there. It says water over roadway. So this will be interesting. We could have uh, put on our hip waders. <laughs> you know, one thing that I want to do though, before we hit the water is I want to see how well this does a zero to 60. Let's go ahead and stop here. I'm gonna put it in sport mode, put it in drive, and I'm just gonna mosh the throttle. Let's see what it does. Three, two, one, go. Ooh, a little wheel spin actually, that's kind of surprising. 40. 50 and 60. Okay, it wasn't particularly quick, but I think honestly for people who are shopping for something like this, it was probably fast enough. Ooh, splashy, splashy. Dang, that's a lot of water. <laughs> as much as I would like to just go through this at 90 miles an hour and skip over the top of it, hydro lock is a concern. So let's, uh, let's keep things kind of chill, shall we? Sploosh. It is definitely wet out here. It looks like the rivers have crested a little bit. We got some water crossing the road. In other words, great day for an adventure. And I got a couple markers here actually on the um, cars maps, which is interesting. Ooh, that's splashy. Ha! <laughs> okay, let's try the next one. See how deep this one is. Oh, that one looks more like a river than a wa- Oh my gosh. Okay, this, this is deep. I'm, I'm going slower here. Oh, actually there's a hole in the road right there. So I don't want to go that way. Wow. Surprise this road is still open. 
well, onward. <laughs> So at this point, before we lose cellular connectivity, I'm gonna use the maps to navigate us where we're going. And yeah, with this system, it's all based around voice. Navigate to High Steel Bridge. I found High Steel Bridge. Would you like to go now? Yes. Calculating route to High Steel Bridge. Bet you didn't think they'd find that in their maps, but they did. So it looks like we have about a 30 minute drive. Okay. And looks like the rain is letting up a little bit too, which is nice. What I find really interesting about this vehicle is actually how much I feel that back electric motor. You really feel like there's something happening back there, which I couldn't have said that about earlier versions of Toyota's um, e all wheel drive system, but I, I'm actually starting to really like it. Theoretically, you know, having a dedicated electric motor in the back is almost optimal for a hybrid based system because you get that electric torque push from the back end. More splash, and yeah, even though it's electric, it can still go through water. <laughs> As we're continuing on, we're going right next to the Skykomish River, which is flooding here, and I love how they built this retaining wall. Clearly flooding was a major issue here. Uh, so we're actually below the level of the river right now. Hi river. <laughs> I kind of like this nav system actually. It seems to do a really good job of finding the things that I want to find using just voice commands. Uh, the routing seems pretty intelligent. I mean, it's it definitely doesn't feel like, you know, a 1.0. It feels a little bit more refined than that. So that's a good thing. And now we are heading into the mountains. This is one gateway to the South Olympic mountain range. This is a nice little road. It's paved a lot of the way, but then the paving gets pretty bad after a while. And then it goes to dirt and then more dirt. And then, <laughs> and then we get to the high steel bridge. Should have a nice view up here though. Anyway, here we go. We're now on gravel. So there's a spot up here, which is uh, kind of a deep little muddy turnaround. And I think it'll be fun to do it in the Ranger. So I'm gonna make Nick do it in the Ranger and I'm gonna watch. <laughs> and uh, then depending on how well the Ranger does it, then maybe we'll take the Highlander through the same obstacle. Uh, but for right now, I'm just doing it because it's fun. So this will be a brief intermission where we get to watch a Ranger go through a mud pit. Sounds like fun, right? Hey Nick, so we're just going to do a brief little aside here, give you a little something fun other than just hanging around to drag me out of a hole. Uh, I'm going to let you go down this, take a hard right, and then take another hard right. Okay. It's basically a deep mud bog loop. It's a little random off spurt of a uh, Forest Road 23, I think it was. And we're filming the Highlander, but we want to see what this Ranger does. We found this little offshoot of the offshoot. Little mud hole. Stay out wide so I'm not about as good as I can do. <laughs> Slip right back in the hole. Hey, but watch out for those branches over there. Yeah, I'm trying. It just slips me right back into the ruts. Yeah. Yeah, this was not hard at all for this. I mean, it's, it's just a basic little, uh, if you are from the Washington area, you know, like up in these forest roads, it's just kind of like these random offshoots. And they're not usually too hard. So for something like this, the Ranger, it's not too bad. And we're through, no big deal. So what do you think? Wasn't too bad. It's yeah. a little muddy, so it's a little slick, trying to stay on that first corner, I was trying to stay on the inside, or I was trying to stay on the outside so I didn't slip in and hit the, um, hit that little shelf of like roots and stuff. But with how slick it is and how muddy it is, you just slide right back in. Not too bad, it's nothing for this, that's for sure. Should if, I give if, it a try in the Highlander? Yeah, I think you can do it. Great, well let's get set up. Cool. Right, here we go, I'm gonna go put the tra drive mode to normal. I'm also gonna turn on trail mode. Which, by the way, if you're in sport mode and you hit trail, it'll automatically bump you back to normal anyway. Now, a couple things to be considered here. 
ground clearance. We have eight inches, which may or may not be enough. We'll see. Also, don't want to rip off that front bumper. That would be awkward to hand back this vehicle to Toyota with no front bumper. Oh, and we've got stumps on each side. I got to watch out for those too. Uh, that, those could seriously cause problems. And this has such a long wheelbase, although not longer than the Ranger. So I got to turn. Wah! Boy, those, uh, those edges are an issue, aren't they? Oh, I'm going to turn on the trail cam so I can kind of see where my line is. This will help me avoid uh, roots and stuff like that while Nick's getting reset in the front there. So let's see. It's probably going to give me lots of radar beeps. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh, we're just using EV mode right now. That's cool. And up and out. It's slippery, but no problem at all. Okay. Well, that's fun. It really wasn't a challenge, but uh, <laughs> it's still fun nonetheless. Oh. Okay, let's continue our adventure up into the mountains towards the high steel bridge. So even with these really big wheels, it actually does a pretty good job on this pothole road uh, it's really soaking up the bumps I actually think this is a really good suspension for this kind of stuff I imagine if you put some smaller wheels maybe some 17s or 18s uh, and a tire that is more suited to this this vehicle would actually do really well the limitation here is the wheel and the tire I just can't bomb down this road too quick uh, for fear of getting a puncture so here's a fun little bit of info about high steel bridge Back in the 1980s, the World Rally Championship was in the US. And in fact, they ran on these very roads uh, here at the foot of Mount Olympus. And uh, these are, it's a little bumpy. I'm a little worried about the rims. <laughs> uh, and High Steel Bridge was actually the start of one of the stages. I just, I can't even imagine. That must have been so awesome to hear those Group B era cars just fully lit up in that canyon on top of that magnificent bridge. That'd be so cool to see. I wish I could find footage. I've looked online and I can't find any footage of it anywhere. Oh well. So we only got a couple more miles of this to get up to High Steel Bridge. And this, this type of outing is exactly what the vehicle is designed for. The Highlander isn't an extreme off-roader. It's not even designed for like technical trails because it's just physically too big. Uh, it's really designed for cruising, going to some adventurous location uh, and looking good and being comfortable doing it. And I think to that effect, this is a very, very successful vehicle. And the new version with the brand new updated infotainment uh, with that great E all wheel drive system. I mean, it's really just a fantastic vehicle. And here we are, high steel bridge, second highest structure or bridge of this kind in the United States. And it's just right here in the middle of nowhere in the Olympic forest. It's so weird. Now, the funny thing about this bridge is you don't feel like you're very high. You're just rolling, you're rolling. Oh, look, it's a normal bridge. Everything is normal, so normal, so normal. And then the earth just falls away. <laughs> what? We are so high. For Driving Sports TV, thanks for watching. We'll see you again real soon. Be sure to like, subscribe, share our videos. We make them for you, and I hope you enjoy them.